Hello everyone. In this section, we're going to build upon the last lesson that focused on getting the StatsBomb data into a usable format and extend our visualization capability in R to be able to produce interactive web applications using R Shiny. R Shiny is a package within R that allows you to build web apps with massive extensibility in being able to customize your applications with CSS, HTML widgets, and JavaScript actions. Some examples of Shiny applications can be found through the shinyrstudio.com uh, gallery page, which I will link to the bottom of this uh, YouTube video. And here you can get a sense of what Shiny is capable of doing. Um, as you will find, you will probably see that it is quite capable of producing amazing uh, web applications. Um, in our series uh, focused on our Shiny, we will be developing an application to analyze uh, shot maps, and uh, I'll be showing you a preview of what we're going to be making. But uh, before we get started, um, I want to do some housekeeping and go back to the code that was first discussed in the first R lesson. If you are following from lesson number one, or if this is your first time here uh, in the learning how to code in R series, um, just a quick recap. We took the StatsBomb data that is provided to us uh, graciously by StatsBomb, um, which is located in their GitHub page, and we learned how to extract out the data such as competitions, matches, and events. Uh, from the events file, we took uh, passes and the starting 11 um, specifically. And while I was producing the content for the series on R Shiny, I realized that there was a bug in my code that I would like to address. So if you would like to follow along, um, please download the StatsBomb Shiny part 1.r uh, file from the Friends of Tracking GitHub, and you'll be able to reproduce uh, the same bug. So um, to get started, run all of the code. Run all of this code uh, up until you get to event uh, files. And then now when you are going to start your event list or your event uh, loop, set I to be 809. And run everything within the event loop up until pass team to DF. Now we're going to set uh, P to be 367. And let's see what the bug is. So we're going to first just look at what the pass looks like from the JSON perspective. And what we see is we see uh, all of the information, ID, index, period, timestamp, um, all of the information that you would expect from a pass. But if you look within the sub element called pass, uh, we see length, angle, height, and location, but we don't see anything called recipient. And if you go back to the original code um, that was shared, you'll see that I originally defined the receiver to be um, found at uh, pass temp, pass recipient name, because I automatically assumed that every single pass had uh, a recipient as a sub element within pass. But if we go back to looking into this, what we see is within pass, there's nothing called recipient. So let's take a look at an example where it does show that. So let's take a look at um, 366. And let's run this again. What we see within pass is now that we actually have a recipient uh, sub element within pass. And so what I was doing was I was automatically assuming that every single pass that StatsBomb provided, provided us with a recipient. So now what I'm assuming is that some passes are labeled as passes, but they might not actually have a receiver, which makes a lot of sense and probably should have had that assumption from the get go. So if we go back to um, the index of P equal to 367, 
let's see what kind of issue this arises for us if we just assume that recipient exists when it actually does not exist. So let's run past temp again. And now let's try to run this line of code. What we get is we get a null. And so if we try to run everything up until row to add, we get back a vector that has 11 elements in it. 11 elements. And we're missing the um, we're missing the receiver effectively from this from this vector. And so let's go back again to 366, where we had a recipient and see what that looks like. We have 12 elements and uh, element number seven is now the name of the recipient. So what kind of issues does this cause if we are trying to call row bind to a data frame that generally has 12 elements in, in, in it or 12 columns, but instead we are trying to now pass in a vector that only has 11 elements. So if we just run this uh, code again with the, with the bug in it, and we take a look at the passes for team two, We'll scroll down to um, 368 and we're scrolling down to 368 because the row names are starting with two. So row name 368 is referring to your index of 367. Um, if we go to 367, oh, sorry, 368, whoops. What we see is we see the pass ID, we have the possession number it was, uh, we see the passer name and the uh, location of the pass and the kind of pass. But for the receiver, um, we get a numeric instead of an actual person's name. That's because it has completely shifted the vector to the left. So because there was a null value provided to us from receiver, it thinks the uh, location of reception is actually now the value of receiver. So if we now look at the end of this row, we see the body part is now this uh, weird identifier, which is actually the same value that we see in pass ID. So effectively, because the receiver uh, variable um, gave us null again, it thought the vector was length uh, 11, so to make it length 12 to fit the um, general structure of the data frame for the passes that has 12 columns, it created a 12 element vector by recycling the first element as the last element. And you can even see this happen again for another pass. We can see that um, the 39 within receiver should actually be under x.receive and the 76 should actually be under y.receive. And we see now the body part here refers back to the pass ID. So in order to fix this, what we need to do is we need to create an if else statement, which is effectively just going to say, well, hey, look at the names that are within pass temp dot pass, which is uh, the variable that you have for one particular pass and then passes the sub element uh, that explains kind of the meta information around the pass. So look at the different names within pass. In this case, the names here are recipient, length, angle, height, and location, body part. Look at those names and check to make sure that uh, recipient is there. In this case, what I'm saying is if recipient is not found in these names, in these names here, please give me an NA. Um, and if it is there, actually do give me the name. So if I rerun this loop, um, let's see what we get now. The code is fixed and we should now see that reflected within
our data. So we'll scroll down all the way to the end. Sorry, I have to reinitialize the data frame. Apologize, guys. So let's rerun this again. Okay. Now what we should see is, we now see an MA here within um, the row name 368, but this is actually referring to P equals 367. And so now we see an NA under the receiver, and now we get actually the body part provided to us. So when you're going through your own code, this is just one small fix that I had to make in making sure that I'm getting the correct pass information. So now what I want to do is I want to step through the uh, additional lines or the additional uh, concept found within this event for loop to include all of the shots. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail into this because uh, the way that I'm getting the shots is already explained in lesson one, but effectively I'm just grabbing uh, the shot information here and um, I'm going to get the information about who was the person that made the shot, where was the location, um, the kind of shot it was, if XG is provided to us, if StatsBomb provides us an expected goals value for the shot, to give that to me, otherwise give me NA. And then also, what was the key pass? So what was the assist uh, to the shot? And uh, in the next part of this video, we're going to uh, use this information to produce our first um, Shiny application. So the Shiny application that we will be developing by the end of this series will allow you to create a shot map calculator that is going to filter based on competition, season, team, the type of shot that is being uh, performed, and the outcome, and also what body part was being used for the shot. Um, also, you'll be able to filter shots based on expected goal, um, and the additional field visualization that you see on the screen will allow you to select from which area you want to see shots happening based on where the assist came from. And so this is what you're seeing in, the, uh, in this video. So let's go ahead and create our first Shiny application, and it'll be the first step towards creating the application that you saw in the, in the last section. So um, using the StatsBomb Shiny part one dot R uh, file uh, that was found through the Friends of Track and GitHub, um, Make sure that you run all of the code, or make sure you first understand what's happening in each lines of the code. But if you do recreate this yourself, or you run this yourself, um, towards uh, until the end of uh, running the event uh, list loop, you will have um, an event list that has uh, three lists within each game. So each element within event list is going to be a game ID. And then within the game ID, the first element will be the starting 11 uh, formations for each team. The second element will be the passes that are done by each team. And then the third element will be the shots, the shots that are done for each of the teams. So please do review um, the code if you haven't uh, written this yourself or if you haven't followed along, just to make sure that you know what you're doing. Um, if you do want more comments, uh, please, if you do want more comments in the code, 
uh, please do request uh, me for that specifically. Um, so what we're going to first do is we're first going to uh, utilize the event list list that we created and extract only the shots. So I'm going to go through this portion pretty quickly um, just to explain what each line is doing. So the first line is going to loop through each of the elements in event list and it's going to get the third element within each element in event list. So what I mean by that is it's going to go into this match ID 15946 and it'll get the third element, which is the shots. It'll then go into 15956 and then it'll go to the third element and then get the shots there and so on and so forth. So that's what this first line is doing. And if we look at what shots gives us, we now see that we have um, each match, but then within each match, only two sub lists, which is going to be one value per, per team. And now what we want to do is we want to combine all this information together into one big data frame, and that is effectively what this is doing. So the L apply uh, being applied to shots means it's going to perform some function over each element in the list shots. So it'll perform some function on this, on this, on this. And uh, the function it's going to perform is it's going to combine both lists together into one data frame. And then what we want to do is we want to uh, append that to our LD ply function, which we find from the package plier to be able to create a new column in this data frame that gives us the match ID. Uh, one way to understand better um, how this code is working would be for you to first maybe just run this, uh, run this code first. So maybe define shots.df as this first and then look at what shots.df gives you. Effectively just again a list, but then now the element within each sub list is a data frame that contains the shots from both teams. And then would be the second step would then be to put that function inside of the LD ply to then understand that the output of this gives you the same thing, except now for all matches, for all teams, all shots a structured data frame. So this next line, what it's doing is it's using uh, dplyr, the dplyr package, um, specifically the group by, to group by match ID and uh, team ID to calculate what was the overall expected goals that that team should have scored given the sum of all of the expected goals of, uh, of their shots. So that's what this line here is, is doing. Um, in Shot Shiny, uh, so I'm creating this data frame now called Shot Shiny, and this is just merging the information from uh, shots.df with all matches just to give us information about each match. So in this case, I'm pulling information based on the competition, the season, the score, um, and the teams involved. Again, I'm just pulling in this information maybe because it could be useful in, in the future. Um, in this line, I am calculating the team score. So sometimes the team ID for a particular match is actually the home team, and then and other times they're the away team. So I want to standardize this column and create one column that represents the team score relative to the team ID for a particular shot. So if we go into Shot Shiny, we'll see that we have a team score here. Team score is equal to um, three. And that's because the home score was uh, three to nothing and the team ID in question was 217. If we look at the 206 here, which was a shot done by the opponent team, we see the team score was zero. And that's because 
Um, 206 was the away team ID, and so we are going to grab the away score column for that value rather than the home score. So just giving us uh, a, a column to have this data in a more standardized way. Lastly, I'm just going to create a column called uh, expected goals difference. It could be useful for your own analysis, could be useful in general, and I'm just simply wanting to calculate, well, how often, how well did the Uh, how well did the team do uh, relative to how well they were expected to do? So what were the actual goals they scored um, subtracted from the expected goals that they scored? This sort of information could be really helpful because if we see a team is consistently um, underperforming, meaning that uh, they're expected to be scoring at least three goals a game, but they're only scoring one or two, uh, it could be a source for further exploration. Um, OK, so the next um, the next few lines is just going to give us the team name, the actual team that uh, did the shot. So that's what these lines do. And uh, the last line is just adding a column called is assisted. And uh, what that means is for each shot, I just want a Boolean, a true or false value, if there was a shot or not, uh, if there was an assist for the shot or not. Um, this information can be helpful. Again, I'm just adding some meta information, some metadata around each shot uh, for further exploration if you choose to do so. So the final uh, data frame looks like looks like this. We have the team ID, the match ID, the player who took the shot, um, the expected goals, the kind of shot it was. If there was an assist, if there was a key pass, where was the location of the key pass? The shot outcome, uh, the competition, the home away score. We have the actual score uh, of that uh, team that took the shot. Um, and we have the difference between what they were expected to score based on the sum of all of the shots, shots expected goals and what they actually scored. Uh, and also a column just to give us if the shot was assisted or not. So this sort of data frame should be comprehensive enough for you to be able to create uh, some sort of analysis uh, with this. So in the last section, uh, we defined our shots data frame, and now we want to start doing things with the shot, uh, the shots data frame. Uh, we're going to build a very basic shiny application, and it's through building a basic shiny application that we will understand the fundamental components that go within building interactive web apps in R. Uh, upon this foundation, we will be able to then create more complex applications. So if you haven't done so already, uh, run this line of code. Make sure that you install the Shiny package um, by running install package of Shiny and then load Shiny into your global environment. The first thing that you should do uh, if you're new to Shiny or even if you're not, even if you are familiar with Shiny, but you always need to go back and reference something is to run this uh, function called run example. In the console, we see this line of text or this piece of text that tells us that uh, examples are uh, one hello, two text, three reactivity, four MPG, all the way to 11 timer. So if we run one of these examples, we get back a shiny application. And uh, it's through this that we will pick this apart, uh, understand what are the different things that are happening uh, to surface what you are seeing here. So let's look at this one by one. This application has a title, Hello Shiny. It has a slider input um, that has a title of the slider called number of bins. You have a min and max value, and also you set a default value of 30. And then you also have a area where you are creating a plot. 
and it's through this plot that we are showing. Uh, it's through this uh, part of the application that we're showing this histogram plot. So uh, this plot, though, is not just a static plot, and that's the beauty of our shiny. Is if we change the slider uh, to say 18, we now see a histogram that's showing us 18 bins. If we go to 50, we see 50. If we go to six, we see six. So let's see the code uh, go line by line and try to understand what's happening. Um, every Shiny application has two components. It has a UI component and it has a server component. The UI component um, dictates to the application what exactly are we going to show in the front end? What are we going to visualize? What is the user going to see? And the server part of the code is uh, showing you um, what is the calculation engine behind what the user sees and how are we actually creating these uh, plots and what are we actually doing with these inputs that are shown here. So looking at just the UI, um, UIs are generally defined by this function called fluid page. And the fluid page, you can think of it as a blank canvas for your app. Um, it's just going to be all white. You're going to see nothing on it and it's ready for you to define further things such as what sort of inputs do you want? Uh, what kind of outputs do you want and where do you want these things and any sort of uh, text and style editing that you would like. So the first thing that we add here or the first thing that they're adding here in the demo is a title and uh, you see its title panel hello shiny which you see here. After every single component within the, U, uh, within the UI we see a column. The sidebar, the sidebar layout is a function that says um, it's the most default expression for most shiny applications that you see and it effectively automatically generates a portion of the application that's dedicated to this sidebar which you see uh, that's grayed out a little bit and then also the main panel so whenever you call the sidebar layout you're always going to give it two functions, uh, one sidebar panel and the other main panel. Sidebar panel is going to define what you put into the sidebar. Uh, the main panel is going to be what you define outside of the sidebar. So within the sidebar panel, uh, we see that we're defining one thing called a slider input, which corresponds to the slider that we see here. The slider input has five variables that we pass into it. Uh, we pass it an input ID called bins, there is a, a label called number of bins, which corresponds to the title of the slider itself. We see a min and max, one to 50, and that corresponds to the slider's uh, options, one to 50. And then we see a value of 30, um, which we see, which if we refresh this application, we see that the slider actually starts at 30. Um, so this defines what we see in the side, uh, sidebar panel. In the second part of our Shiny series, I will explain different sort of inputs that you can put and how to uh, really customize this sidebar. And uh, what we see in the main panel, uh, the histogram, is we see just one line of code. It just says plot output, output ID equals displot. So this sort of plot has this ID called displot. Now, if we look into the server, we see the server is a function that takes in an input and an output. The best way to think about this is um, the input is provided to you by the input that you've defined in your UI. And uh, the input has variable names that you can call. And these variable names are going to be referenced using the input IDs that you've defined. The output is variables that you define within the server, and these things are usually taking into consideration whatever your input is. So if we take into if we take a look at the server function, we see an output dollar sign displot. So we're defining a variable within our output called displot, and uh, it's going to be invoking this function called render plot. Render plot is used because it associates with the UI counterpart called plot output. In part two of Shiny, you will see some things called uh, render table. And then in this case, it wouldn't be called plot output, but it would be called table output. 
So in the server side, uh, this function call is letting the application know whatever is inside this um, output, this plot is going to be referenced as a plot. And then the UI knows to make it as a plot because of this function called plot output. So the output is called this plot, which corresponds to the output ID that we've provided in our plot output. And so by making sure that these two match, we know that we are going to surface the histogram in the application. So let's look at what it's doing. Um, X is being defined as the faithful data set that's already provided to you in R. Um, and it's just taking out the waiting time periods. Bins is creating all these different histogram bins based on the min and max value, but then also based on the number of bins that it should be providing. And the number of bins is defined by this variable here, input bins plus one. And if you remember, uh, input is one element or one parameter that we feed into our server function. And the input bins is actually referencing the slider input um, because it has the input ID equal to bins. And so this is what is effectively uh, changing the number of bins that we see within our histogram. So if I change this, we see that this whole part of the code changes. And that's specifically because this line is changing, the bins line. It's changing the number of bins that it wants to show and creating um, a new sequence of bins or a new a numeric vector of bin values to be shown. So if we run this again, we see that it updates. And uh, the last part is a histogram. Um, and this is the part that we are going to visualize. So this histogram has the data and then the breaks are being defined by the number of bins that we have defined. And that's really about it. So uh, to recap, um, Shiny applications have two components, UI and server. The UI is defining what the end user sees in the application. The server defines all of the computational logic that goes into what's going to be surfaced into the front end. And uh, the output is, sorry, whoop, the output is usually um, referenced within the main panel, as we see here, this plot in the UI it refers to the output dollar sign this plot. And then the inputs that we defined in the UI with these input IDs for the slider, they are uh, referenced as uh, input within the server as input dollar sign bins. So if we cut and copy this code, um, cut and copy this and paste this into your own R script, as you can see, I did the same thing. Um, everything is effectively the same. I just made a few changes. So instead of uh, waiting time periods for our geyser, what I want to do is I want to create an interactive shot map that is going to show um, the number of shots on a map uh, based on the slider input. So I have a slider input and its variable name is going to be called shots. Um, the title of the slider will be number of shots. The minimum value is show me uh, at least one shot on the map, and then the maximum value is obviously show me all of the shots that we have in our data frame uh, in the map. And so as you can see, we don't necessarily have to just rely on hard coded values. We can pass in uh, variable names um, into your Shiny application as long as these variables are listed within your global environment. The default value for the slider will be the number of shots that we have within our data frame, which I believe is 20,380. In our main panel, we are going to output something called a shot plot. So if we use the same logic that we saw in our example, we see our output is being defined a variable called shot plot. It's being defined under render plot, which corresponds to the plot output that we see here. And uh, within render plot, we are going to define X, where X is just randomly sampling um, the shots from the shots data frame that we uh, want to visualize. So sample is a very good function for being able to split data sets into training and test uh, sets um, when you are running machine learning experiments. And uh, just to give you a sense of how this works is if I say sample, but I remove this and I change this to 10, it gives me 10 random indices 
of the shots data that I would like to get. So I can just refer. Um, I could run something like this and get back the 10 rows or the 10 shots that are randomly selected from our complete shots database or our complete shots data frame. So this is what's going to be changed based on the slider input. And then what we're going to visualize is we're going to visualize a football pitch uh, that has all of the shots that we define with X. And then we're going to place that location based on the shots location and then color each shot based on its XG. Um, just to remind you, the Hori 5, uh, horizontal 5, is a football pitch that you can find the code for in the uh, draw pitch R file that's located in the Friends of Tracking um, GitHub. So if we run this now, um, we can't just hit run app because it will try to run the entire script, which is not what we want to do, even though you can do that uh, at the end of this if you'd like. We only just want to run the selection. So um, we can hit control enter to find what the keyword or to find what the, the key shortcut, keyboard shortcut is for you. Uh, go to code and then see what it says for run selected lines. For me, it's control enter. So I'm going to just hit control enter to run only those lines. And what we see is a shiny application with our sidebar uh, panel showing the slider and then the main panel showing the number of shots. So if I slide this around, the number of shots changes. If I only want to see 1,201 shots, we can see that. If I want to see 4,000 shots, we can see that. If I just want to see one shot, we can see that. Um, and again, this is because in this code, the X that we defined in the X that we defined in our code here is being uh, sensitive or it's being responsive to our slider that we have here. So this more or less shows you the basics of how to create your first Shiny application. Um, in part two, uh, I'm going to go in more depth as to the types of things that we can put into our inputs. So not just sliders, but maybe even have check mark check boxes um, and also show that we can have even visualizations as an input itself, similar to what you saw in the app uh, earlier in this video. In part three of this video, we will then put everything together. Uh, go into the complexities of the server side of the application and by the end of it you will be able to create your first uh, shot map application that is able to filter shots based on the location of the assist. Um, thank you guys for listening and watching. Stay tuned for more videos. As always on Thursdays we have our uh, live sessions and uh, see you guys next time.